I'm Heather Punky, an editor with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation, and we will have a question and answer session following the completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have and will follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time, but that email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introdu introduce today's presenters. Nicole Kinney, Kenny has 20 years of experience as a technical consultant, educator, trainer, and author working in the field of environmental science, environmental hygiene, and chemical disinfection for infection prevention. Nicole is the Senior Director of Professional and Technical Services at Virox Technologies, Inc., a company with a patented technology in cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization for hands, surfaces, and devices, where she is responsible for infection prevention education relating to chemical disinfection, technical support, and clinical studies. Nicole has authored numerous infection prevention-related articles for trade magazines and has co-authored two peer-reviewed articles and has two peer-reviewed articles pending publication. She also works closely with Virox's strategic partner, Sealed Air, to identify and address customers' infection prevention challenges. Nicole and her colleagues maintain a blog called Talk Clean to Me to discuss the use of disinfectants on surfaces, devices, and hands and their effective use for infection prevention. We also have Peter Tesca, who graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point with a bachelor's degree in chemistry and multiple minors in physics, mathematics, microelectronic, and microcomputer systems. He worked for five years for Stearns Packaging Corporation in Madison, Wisconsin as the manager of research and development. Tesca next went to work for U.S. Chemical in Watertown, Wisconsin as an applications chemist and then a training specialist. While at U.S. Chemical, he completed his master's degree in business administration from Cardinal Stritch University in the fall of 2002. In 2012, he moved to Diversity's global health team and is currently the global healthcare sector expert, supporting Diversity's efforts in healthcare by working with infection preventionists and thought leaders around the world. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Peter to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Heather. If you'd go to slide two. Here's the objectives for our presentation today. We have three. We want to outline the key components of a successful disinfection program. We then want to talk about potential barriers to success and define ways to overcome these barriers. Next slide, please. This is an outline of what we'll cover in the presentation today. We're going to start by talking about common issues that can negatively impact disinfectant performance. We'll then talk about balancing the trade-offs to optimize disinfectant selection. And then finally, we'll talk about best practices to achieve cleaning and disinfection compliance. Next slide, please. So we'll start with what looks like a typical patient room and ask the question, what can go wrong in cleaning and disinfecting? On the surface, the patient room looks clean. But one of the problems with disinfection as an application is a, a surface that's pathogen-free and one that's loaded with pathogens can look exactly the same. There's no visual indicator that a surface has pathogen contamination. And thus, there can be a tendency for people to look at cleanliness as a measure of whether or not a surface is hygienic from a pathogen standpoint. But we want to ensure that the surfaces, especially in a healthcare environment, are pathogen-free, thus the use of disinfectants. Next slide, please. So first, call out what can go wrong in cleaning and disinfection, that germs are invisible. It's difficult to know whether or not pathogens have been killed, even if an environmental services worker goes through the room and says that they've done cleaning, it's hard to tell which surfaces they've cleaned and in which ones they've eradicated the pathogens and which ones still have viable pathogens. And this fundamentally is an issue with disinfectants that makes it hard for people to want to spend time improving disinfection performance. If bad disinfection looks the same as good disinfection, it's really hard to justify spending more time on improving disinfection practices. Next slide. Safety concerns can also be a factor. Some disinfectants require the use of personal protective equipment, such as gloves and goggles. Some can cause eye irritation all the way up to eye damage, including blindness. Others can cause rashes up to and including permanent damage to the skin. 
So as a result of this, picking the disinfectant also includes evaluating the health and safety concerns of the disinfectant to ensure that workers carry the proper personal protective equipment. And the disinfectant selection process might favor the use of disinfectants that didn't require personal protective equipment, especially if they're going to be used in public areas where you might have patients and visitors. It would be one thing for the worker to have the right PPE on, but it wouldn't be reasonable to expect visitors and patients to be similarly protected. Thus, we've seen movement over the last 10 to 15 years in looking at disinfectants with lower safety and health risks so that they can be used without PPE and so that they can be used around patients and visitors without any risk of, of uh, physical damage to them either. Next slide, please. Disinfectants can be harsh on surfaces and assets. I would say in general that, that most disinfectants exhibit some degree of risk of damage of surfaces, especially for certain surfaces, meaning that some disinfectant chemistries can attack some surfaces but be relatively benign on others. And this is a complex process for a health facility to go through to assess this risk because they may have hundreds of different devices representing dozens if not a hundred different materials and assessing the safety risk profile for any given disinfecting chemistry on all of these devices is quite a daunting task. Even within the approved list of chemicals that you will find from manufacturers that make medical devices and patient care equipment, you will often find chemistries listed that are known to damage the surfaces, but because of their presence in the market, meaning that these products are sold very widely, often they're included so that customers have uh, some measure of comfort in use of the product and this then creates situations where even those products that are, are recommended can de exhibit some degree of risk. But we would talk about also how you can mitigate this risk through the use of practice. In most cases protocols can be written to help reduce the risk or in some cases outright eliminate the risk of damage to these assets. Yet if simply used without consideration for these revised protocols, one can easily see significant damage to assets in a healthcare environment. Disinfectants can die can dry on the surface before pathogens can die. A little bit of a tongue twister for you this morning. So what this slide speaks to is when you apply a disinfectant to a surface, under normal ambient conditions, the surface is going to start to dry and within about three to four minutes, most of the surface will be dry. If the disinfectant has a contact time of 10 minutes to achieve the efficacy expected, and the surface dries within three, four minutes, one of two things is going to happen. Either the worker is going to reapply the product several times to achieve that 10 minute contact time, or more likely, they're not gonna reapply the product, and you're gonna get less than optimal disinfection. And this fundamentally is one of the key issues with disinfection. Since you can't see when all of the pathogens on the surface are dead, if you use a disinfectant at less than the contact time, it really increases the risk of whether or not the pathogens on the surface have, have died. It is easy to understand or, or predict that if the contact time is maintained, you'll achieve efficacy. That's the whole basis for the government testing programs that are used by the EPA in the US and Health Canada in Canada. But if the surface doesn't follow the label directions, meaning it doesn't follow the contact time, then you start to see suboptimal disinfection and a marked increased risk for patients. And when this happens, it's not readily apparent back to this theme about visually obvious. The fact that germs aren't being killed because the disinfection is suboptimal is something that's not visible to anybody when it occurs. Next slide, please. Compatibility with cleaning tools. Some disinfectants can damage cleaning tools, and this can include cleaning cloths, but it can also include other things like scrapers and dust pans and mops. But the bigger concern from my perspective is the interaction between the wiping substrate and the disinfectant chemistry itself. It's fairly well established now that, especially for disinfectants such as cloths, they have to be applied to surfaces in certain ways to eliminate this risk. Cotton, which is negatively charged, and most microfiber, which also carries a negative charge, will react with positively charged quaternaries. And if a worker is using a bucket and cloth application method where they dump the cloth into a bucket of disinfectant, you would find if you tested the solution that each time the cloth is 
dunked in the solution that a number of the sites on the cloth are bound up with quaternary and then when the surface is wiped they don't release and this is because of the positive negative charge interaction that occurs. When that happens the remaining solution in the bucket will have a lower concentration than at start and the solution being applied to the surface will similarly have a lower concentration than is needed. And again, back to this obviousness issue. So if you put down a disinfectant solution that doesn't have the needed uh, concentration, there's no obvious clue to the worker that they've stopped being able to disinfect. There are workarounds in most cases for disinfecting chemistries. You can change the application method, but that also can create problems because the change in method can increase risk in other ways. And there are disinfecting chemistries on the market that have much less impact or interaction with wiping substrates. The wiping substrate in many cases can be uh, selected with the disinfectant so that there is no risk of this, that there is no interaction. But a lot of the disinfectants used on the market suffer from this risk and consequently have to be applied in very specific ways to minimize this risk. Next slide, please. what, who, when, how. This speaks to knowing which surfaces are going to be cleaned by which worker. If we use a patient room in a hospital as a starting point for this discussion, we'll see surfaces in the room that are obviously going to be cleaned by the environmental services staff. This might include things like the doorknob and the door, light switches, the outside of the sharps container, and in the bathroom, the toilet and the sink. But then you, when you get around the patient, there can be equipment. There can be um, glucose meters. There can be blood pressure cuffs, IV pole stands, telemetry equipment, a number of pieces of equipment that are patient care equipment and in many hospitals would then fall under the responsibility of nursing. Facilities that do this part well have detailed lists of all of the objects or surfaces in a room with a clear understanding of who is responsible. Facilities that don't make general assumptions about who will handle which types of equipment and then never follow up to ensure that the equipment is being disinfected properly. It has happened in several studies. There's been published information to talk about how a study was being done. It involved a piece of equipment and then as part of the study they identified that literally nobody was disinfecting it. Everybody thought somebody else was doing it. And this happens with all too much frequency within our healthcare facilities, especially as new equipment is brought in or equipment is changed or the way in which equipment is used is modified. This then results in situations where equipment isn't being cleaned properly or the people responsible for it aren't doing it and no one else is stepping up to make sure that surfaces are being disinfected to protect the patients. Next slide, please. Inaccessible means ineffective. When disinfectants are out of sight, they're out of mind. This is, to me, a, a great concept to communicate as well. I routinely go into hospitals and see that they have disposable disinfectant wipes in the patient room, but they have them in a cabinet or in a closet or in some way where it's not readily accessible to the staff. <coughs> Excuse me. Much in the same way that hand hygiene is all about access to it, that the, the more access you provide, the easier it is for people to do it. Disinfection is the same thing. If you're expecting nurses to wipe off certain pieces of equipment as they bring it out of a room, but then the wipes are located back at the nurse's stand or they're in a cabinet where the nurse has to remember to go get them. Nurses are much less likely to remember to do this. And in the same way for environmental services, if you have to have certain disinfectants used on specific pieces of equipment to reduce damage or for other reasons, making sure that that same disinfectant is readily accessible in the same way that the primary disinfectant is is also a consideration in this space. Making sure that the workers have these products readily available and readily accessible is a key to getting them to use them properly. So in some cases, the use of pre-wetted disposable wipes in canisters that can be mounted on the side of cleaning carts or hung on the side of a bed or in some other way made to be more accessible is preferred to having larger containers that have to be carried on a cart that don't travel wherever the workers are, that sort of consideration. Next slide, please. Nicole. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, I think what we'll, uh, as Peter outlined, the, there's the truth, there are a number of things that can go wrong with cleaning and disinfection. And what you'll see in the next series of slides is, is a road, what we've put together is a roadmap to successful compliance disinfecting program in that there's five different areas to really consider, and they tie very nicely into the same issues that we may have when, there, when there's errors occur. Um, and so what, we're gonna, what I'm going to do in the next several slides is just kind of break it down into bite-sized chunks and uh, try to hopefully give you some areas that you want to focus. Next slide, please. And Peter's talked a little bit about clear roles and responsibilities. Um, and this is really one of the key areas to consider when we're developing a cleaning and disinfection program. Um, and generally speaking, when, I, when I'm talking to an audience, I can see uh, who I'm speaking to. And so I often ask the following questions, and, and I'm looking for a show of hands. So I'm hoping, um, well, that's not going to work today when I ask the questions. But I'm hoping that you'll take a few seconds to reflect and honestly answer to yourself um, if you have done any of the following. And so first, have you ever met with both environmental services and nursing or clinical staff in order to gain agreement as to who cleans what and when is it supposed to happen? And the next question I have is, if you, if you have not done that, have you ever investigated to see if environmental services and nursing have written procedures for cleaning and disinfections? And do the, the items that they have um, within their protocols, do they uh, done, are, are they married quite nicely? So we're ensuring that, that all surfaces are being cleaned and all, all pieces of equipment are being cleaned. The reason why I ask these questions is that, in our experience, one of the greatest challenges to cleaning and disinfection is unclear roles and responsibilities. And that, in fact, there is confusion as to who cleans what um, and when it should be cleaned. And in fact, some hospitals, environmental services are not responsible for daily cleaning of bed rails because they don't want to disturb the patient. Yet the clinical staff isn't doing that either. And I'd like to give three other examples um, that I've kind of learned or seen from the field, and Peter had, uh, had alluded to one. Um, but one I think is my favorite and why we have a picture here is the commode example. Um, I was working several years ago with, with a facility. We were doing a clinical study. And with this, we were focusing on the effective cleaning of, um, of patient rooms with C. diff, particularly targeting uh, toilets and commodes to make certain that these were, uh, were being cleaned as effectively as possible. And what we found, we were using the UV uh, reflectant um, material that was going on the bottom of the, uh, of the toilet seat and was being looked at every day to ensure that surfaces were being clean. And in a particular case with one broom that was in fact a C. diff patient who had a commode to use, for four days in a row the commode was not clean. And the research assistant finally you know, said, this is enough is enough, we've, we've got to see what's going on here. And she was seeing the same pieces of, of fecal debris on the, uh, on the surface underneath the, um, the seat. And so she brought in environmental services and uh, the, the research staff and the nursing staff together to try to figure out what was going on. And in this particular facility, well, it came down to a commode was on wheels. Therefore, environmental services consider that a portable uh, uh, patient care device. And nursing felt that, well, a commode's a toilet. And so because it's a toilet, it's really an environmental surface that housekeeping should be cleaning. And so it was a great example of, of a facility that hadn't kind of sat down together to figure out what are the pieces of equipment that we have within a room and who needs to clean what. Um, another area that we need to consider, um, particularly when working with our housekeeping staff, and this is something that I saw um, quite recently and had never taken into consideration myself, um, but when we have patients who are um, using the facilities uh, and nursing or doctors need to see what they have voided, whether it's their urine or their feces, in order to see how, how they're doing from a health perspective. And, and the situation that I got into recently was that a housekeeper was trying to clean the room, but she was specifically told by um, the patient helper not to flush the toilet, which meant how can you effectively clean a room she tried to do her best. Of course, the nurse or the doctor hadn't come in, and so she went on um, to cleaning another room. But the issue we get into there is, is she's not going to have the time to go back to clean that toilet. So then we do have issues um, where if, if that's the situation, then should that be somebody else's responsibility um, to ensure that that's being cleaned? And the last example, um, again, was when I was out in the field doing some auditing. And we are looking at, at how effectively a facility was being cleaned during a VRE outbreak. And so I spent some time for about eight hours auditing housekeeping staff, watching what nursing was doing. And uh, it was unfortunate for that uh, eight-hour period of time, 
where there were several opportunities for uh, shared patient care equipment to be cleaned, I didn't see a nurse take a single wipe and clean any of their shared patient equipment. So again, it's really important that, uh, that we do have some specific uh, examples and protocols and practices in place. Because really the bottom line is we know that in order uh, for things to be effective and to reduce the transmission of pathogens um, and reduce transmission of pathogens to the hands of our healthcare workers, we have to clean, and that's vitally important. Next, we'll, our next slide, please. And the next area, of course, is choosing the right product. And we have an image here, really, of a, of a balance, because it really is um, finding that balance. Um, certainly, we want to look at, at choosing products that have effective, uh, contact, or effective claims. And so what are the organisms that we're most concerned with so that we do have our, our um, efficacy from a kill perspective? And as Peter had alluded to, the contact time is important because if we have products that are um, have longer contact times and are drying before that contact time, well, we're not achieving um, disinfection. So that is, is certainly going to be uh, a consideration that we have to take in place. Um, the other areas that we need to take into consideration, again, Peter had alluded to already, was about the cleaning tools. And, and Peter had talked to the, the clot binding effect. But another thing that we can see is also about how effectively does a cleaning cloth, whether it's a cotton cloth, a uh, microfiber, or even the disposable wipe, how effectively does it release the chemical onto the surface? And so um, I've seen one study that our research team did actually looking at this phenomena. And some products will absorb um, onto a, a surface, onto a cloth. And when you're wiping that surface, they don't release. So if you're doing a before and after weight of that cloth, the before weight with the solution and the after weight after you've wiped the surface will be very similar. And that's concerning because if we're not getting the chemical, the disinfectant, onto the surface, again, we're going to have issues with respect to cleaning and disinfection and ensuring that we are um, improving uh, our, our, the cleanliness of our surfaces. And of course, we want to um, combine that or, or balance that off with looking at products that are harmful from a safety perspective. I'm going to talk to that in a little more detail. Um, but also that, that they're not, uh, products aren't unpleasant. We need to make certain that our staff uh, will handle using them and will use them as we need to. Next slide, please. This particular slide is, is basically a summation of um, a couple of, of different areas, but particularly Dr. Ritella's uh, um, article that was uh, published in, in July of last year, in July of 2014. And really when we're looking at an ideal disinfectant, there are five different areas that we want to look at. We've already talked to kill claims, so we want to make certain that we're looking at um, the bugs that are most prevalent in healthcare. Um, but also not just focus on individual organisms, but look at the categories of organisms. And, and kill claims is not about what I call the claims rate. It's not about what product has the most number of claims. It really should be about ensuring that the products have the right claims and have the right spectrum and so that they're killing gram negatives, gram positives, that they're killing envelope viruses, they're killing non-envelope viruses. Those really are our key uh, organisms that are transmitted within um, within our healthcare facilities. Certainly, uh, Clostridium difficile and spores are a concern, and I don't want to downplay that, but when we're looking at, at products and putting in an effective um, cleaning program, we may want to minimize the use of sporocytals from a safety and or compatibility perspective, and so really use those in targeted areas. Uh, fast kill times we've talked to several times, and certainly it is about ensuring that the surface stays wet in that we are achieving the, uh, the contact time uh, listed on either the EPA or the Health Canada label. Safety is an important um, in terms of looking for non-toxic and non-irritating products uh, because if we don't have a safe product, staff aren't, aren't going to use it. Um, and, and then we really are not achieving what we're intending. Ease of use is also important in terms of ensuring that uh, um, the products we're using are unaffected by environmental factors, that it's, uh, um, everybody, as I had talked earlier, was that you can accept the odor, that it's water-soluble, and that it's stable. Also, that it's a one-step disinfectant cleaner. The truth of the matter is, these days, we really only have time to wipe the surface once. If we're only wiping the surface once, then we don't have time to use products that require a pre-cleaning step. And so we do want to use a product that has been tested in the presence of soil challenge, and so it does have the ability uh, to kill the organisms on the surface. Um, uh, in, in terms of typical soils, of course, if we have uh, gross water body fluid, that does need to be removed uh, prior to uh, disinfection. 
And of course, the other factors we need to look at is an economical perspective. What is the cost? And it's not always looking at the cost uh, per meter, um, but looking at the cost from an application, as well as other areas in terms of what type of personal protective equipment do you need to use? Um, is there any concern for long-term exposure? And so if our staff aren't using it or some of the chemicals that uh, can cause occupational asthma um, or some of the chemicals that are now known as carcinogens, we don't want to be choosing products that could cause long-term health effects to our staff. Certainly the other area, and one that I would recommend that we don't underestimate, is really looking at manufacturer support. Um, so what are the, the other, whether it's training, whether it's cue cards, um, anything like that, what else will they have that they can provide you? And so if they have training programs in place, they can come out and do the actual training, and, and at what frequency can you have that? Do they have um, DVDs or other videos that can be watched so that as you have new hires where maybe um, your, your manufacturer is not able to come out and train some of your new staff, you do have similar materials that you can train um, should you hire anybody that's coming in, as well as any well charts, things like that, that it's those physical, those reminders that help or ensure that our staff are using our, our products properly. If you go to the next slide, please. When we look at uh, choosing disinfectants, really um, ensuring that we have a, a product that is going to be safe um, for our staff, safe for our patients, um, as well as pleasant to use, is, is really one of the areas that we need to um, address and, and consider, particularly when we get into the use of clinical wipes um, with the nursing space. And I find that this area is an area where um, you know, we understand the importance of wiping down surfaces, but we also um, are working with uh, highly educated people who have an understanding of what a chemical can do to them. And so I often find in order to ensure that uh, people are using it properly, we need to make certain that they're, um, they're happy, that they understand the safety of the product. And there was actually a study published um, by uh, Ann Matlett out of uh, Sick Kids here in Toronto where she demonstrated and her team demonstrated that healthcare workers are often reluctant to use a product if they believe that it may cause uh, skin or eye or respiratory uh, irritation and or if they have a perception that it is going to be harmful for their patients. Um, and so we've also seen this issue with odor. And so from a, tra a training perspective, it is really important um, that, that this is covered, that the staff understand the safety of the product, the reason why the product has been chosen what PPE that they need to use. Um, and then also, if there's an issue with the smell or, or something in terms of the conversion, it's, it's that constant reaffirming, the constant training, the popping in to make certain that everybody is comfortable with using um, using that. And, and I can't speak for everybody, but I know when I'm out and sometimes talking to different nursing staff and ask them what products they're using, I often hear that people use the cancer wipes. And this just illustrates the example that there's you know, a product out there that somebody has done a Google search and found some information that may be, you know, correct or incorrect, um, but the belief there is that some of the wipes that we use within our healthcare facilities are cancer-causing, and so our staff uh, aren't going to use it um, as effectively as, as what we need. And I, I, you know, again, use an example, have seen a, a nurse where she donned a glove, picked up a disposable paper towel, and then took a wipe out of a canister in order to wipe the surface because she was trying to ensure that the product that she was using was not going to come in contact with her um, in any way. And so, of course, if you're, if you're doing it like that, we're obviously not going to be cleaning the surfaces in the way that we need, and that can lead to the risk of transmission. And so just to conclude there, it really is important that, that staff that um, you know, understand or know that the product that they're using is non-irritating to eyes or skin, uh, is non-irritating to the respiratory tract, and has, an, uh, has a pleasant odor, um, they will utilize uh, in a more effective uh, and efficient manner. Next slide, please. And this takes us into the accessibility, and Peter had covered this quite well already, but really it's ensuring that we have access to the products at point of care so that when we see a blood spill that there is product um, disinfectant that's available, that the blood spill can be picked up, that we can clean and disinfect that area. We're not waiting for somebody to bring us product. Um, 
There's also ways from an accessibility perspective is if we have uh, products that do not require the use of personal protective equipment, we can even involve um, the loved, either patients and or their loved ones in uh, helping keeping their area um, clean. They can actually utilize uh, the wipes that, that might be available in their rooms and they can wipe down some of the spaces in between the cleaning. Um, that's usually happens only on a 24-hour basis. Uh, then it's also ensure that when, when we're putting wipes uh, up or, or any sort of product, that it is where you need to have easy access to it. So again, there's many different uh, wall brackets that we can either mount wipes, particularly when we're talking clinical perspective, either within the room um, or right outside the door. So it is easy uh, for somebody just to pop out and grab a wipe and come back in as opposed to having to walk several, uh, several doors down or that the, uh, the wipes are only kept uh, either on a nurse's station or locked in, in the janitor closet on that particular unit. So it really is when we're dealing with the use of products to make certain that we have wipes on demand, that they're convenient, we can quickly access them, and they are uh, where we need them when we need them. Next slide, please. And so this leads us to really what is the crowning element of any program, and that, of course, is validation. Um, and that's ensuring that the cleaning process, the disinfection process that we are trying to put in place is actually happening. And this is particularly important because pathogens are invisible, and so it is often difficult to confirm proof of process or proof of disinfection. And implementing a program to monitor and measure cleaning and disinfection effectiveness can help you ensure the compliance with this process. And so one of the examples, um, you know, again, that I can have, there's usually two different types of products that we're using, either a UV reflectant um, product that we're using with a black light to ensure that it's been removed, or, um, or ATP. And before I kind of talk into how those are used, I just want to use an example of a facility who, as part of their hiring process or their employee agreement with their housekeeping staff, um, it's written into their employee agreement that they need to achieve a minimum of 80% compliance for the clean. And it's very detailed um, in terms of what happens. First of all, they ensure that they have the, the appropriate training, and a lot of this training has not even just telling them what to do, but they have to repeat back and show and then validate that they're, that they're cleaning properly. Um, so if after one of their random audits they didn't achieve 80%, they will actually have um, retraining on the spot, making certain that they understand what's going on. Um, if it happens the second time, they will actually be brought to HR in terms of discussion about um, performance and the importance of the performance and the fact that they had agreed that they were going to achieve the 80% uh, compliance for the cleaning. And if it happens a third time, well, the three strikes are out principle. They may put them into a different uh, role within the facility, a portering role or something of that nature, but that is the importance with this particular facility. They stress the importance of cleaning and their housekeeping staff are on board and that is part of their, their employee agreement. And so if I touch base on the two different validation programs that, that are often used, UV reflectant products, they are easy to use and they're relatively inexpensive, but there are a few differences between products. Um, some of them actually do not dry clearly. And so I've seen staff where they understand when we're using a, a you know, product where you can see, uh, even though it's dry, you can kind of see a little blob on the surface. I do know that staff will go around a room and just look for the blob um, and wipe those off. And I also worked with a housekeeper who was so excited because she had actually purchased her own black light. And so she would go around the room. She wanted to have the best cleaning compliance of any of the housekeepers. Um, and she was so proud of that fact. But then it kind of led me to question what surfaces wasn't she touching if she was trying to focus on where did she see the reflecting light and making certain she was wiping those surfaces. ATP, uh, that's another uh, device that people are often using. It certainly is gaining popularity um, because it can give an actual reading of um, cleanliness, if you will, on the surface. But when we're implementing a compliance program or designing studies, we have to understand that there are some limitations. And while ATP can be used to validate the cleanliness of a surface, it cannot be used to compare product A or disinfectant A to disinfectant B. And the reason for that is because that there are chemical interferences from the cleaners or the, the disinfectant chemicals, and that has an effect on the ATP reading. And in fact, if you actually ask any of the, the companies that manufacture or sell the ATP meters, they will, will agree that they shouldn't be used in, in that fact. 
You can use them to individually uh, develop your compliance program, but certainly at no point should you uh, try to compare product A to product B, particularly if it's two different um, disinfectant chemistries. So moving into the next session of, of best practices, I think um, there probably has never been a stronger business case to improve cleaning and disinfection, and certainly it's supported by the costs associated with hospital-acquired infections, um, as well the evidence that uh, the environment can play a role in the transmission of pathogens. And we've discussed there are a number of things that can sabotage or reduce the effectiveness of disinfection, and implementing a pro uh, programmatic approach that focuses on the right product, role clarity, accessibility, and validation are the key elements to an effective outcome. But we still missed one key criteria. We can't forget the importance of using products properly. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is actually an example of putting everything together. It was a, public, a study that was recently published, was, uh, published in February of this year in the American Journal of Infection Control. And it was the first clinical study to show that improved compliance with environmental surface disinfection using uh, an accelerated hydrogen peroxide product could reduce the hospital-acquired infection rates for VRE, MRSA, and C. diff. Um, by 20%, and that was individually each were reduced by 20%. And within the study when they're doing before and after comparisons, really this is a facility that's had their validation in process um, for a, a number of years, dating back to the 2006. So they really already had their compliance rate at 80% for the most part. Um, their change was uh, moving to a ready-to-use uh, pre-moistened wipe. Um, and also uh, looking at how they were going to use that pre-moistened wipe in the most effective, effective way. And so the components that really ensured that they were going to see the reduction of the hospital-acquired infections was the fact that they did have this cleaning protocol that was very prescriptive as to when they were to change their cloths within the, the patient room. They had a very strong educational component, one-on-one -on -one training. Um, they had to then, the housekeeper had to repeat what they were trained, and then they left the room, the UV marker was put down, and then they had to repeat again to show that they were achieving 80% compliance with their cleaning. And then, of course, there was the change to the effective cleaner. And it was those three things put together, the fact that they did achieve 80% compliance, the fact that they had a very clear practice and protocol that was in place, as well as the effective use of um, the, the use of an effective disinfectant cleaner, really made the difference and within this facility saw the reduction of their uh, hospital-acquired infection rates by 20%. And really, I think one of the key quotes that I can take from the, the lead researcher is that, you know, housekeepers are the front line in the battle of the bugs. Um, and we know, and this is kind of the study uh, um, agrees, is that if products aren't applied properly to the surface, we're not going to see a beneficial result. And that's it. Peter, back to you. Thanks, Nicole. So to review again, criteria for an ideal disinfectant. This comes from some of the work that Dr. Rattalo has done in a paper that he published, but also our own experience. We want to focus on selecting a product that has the right kill claims for a healthcare environment. We want the product to be broad spectrum. It may have a lot of claims on the label. It may not. But what's important is that it's broad spectrum and that it has certain key claims that you know that are going to be a challenge. Uh, viruses such as norovirus are expected to be on the label. Making sure that you have both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria are important. Representative envelope viruses are important too, although generally they're much easier to kill with disinfectants. But making sure that you have a product that has representative kill claims for the pathogens likely to be present is an important consideration. Nicole and I both have talked about the importance of contact time and achieving an appropriate wet contact time on equipment. Workers generally will not go back to re-wipe disinfectant on surfaces, and if the surface dries too quickly, you'll get suboptimal disinfection. Safety, certainly a consideration, especially related to whether or not the product can be used around the patient or around visitors. Ease of use, products that are easy to use, the workers are more likely to use, whether it's clinical staff or the environmental services department, you want the product to be something that they don't mind using, meaning it doesn't have strong odors or in some other way have objectionable characteristics. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a few related areas as well. So if you're trying to decide on how to create a program for yourself to optimize the use of disinfectants, when we look at practice, we've talked about some of these things already, but I'll review a few of them and, and add some additional comments. 
clear definition of who cleans what paramount to success. The graphic in the center of the screen is one of the wall charts that Diversi uses for work with customers. And the little icons each represent a different surface that's cleaned as part of the disinfection process for patient room cleaning. In some versions of these charts, we put on little circles near the icon to indicate with a color whose responsibility it is. So the patient room cleaning process might list all the surfaces. Some might be cleaned by environmental surfaces. Some might be cleaned by nursing. And some might be cleaned by both. And when you work through a process between nursing and environmental services and infection prevention to detail all of these things, Having that agreement and then converting it into an easy-to-use visual aid is really key to getting workers to use the tool properly and then to ultimately apply it. So as a first step, you want to get agreement on who cleans what surfaces. And then as a second step, you want to create training tools or training aids that will be helpful for those staff in terms of understanding how to apply it. And when workers move from one area of a facility to another, if you've got standardized communication tools, such as this wall chart, it becomes much easier to cross-train them on a part of the building that they've not cleaned before. So whether you're using checklists or wall charts such as this, having this sort of information detailed and in a documented form makes it much easier to audit later on and to hold everybody accountable for delivery of performance. Next slide, please. Compliance, Nicole talked about this extensively, but this really has become the sort of the key area in ensuring that surfaces are being disinfected properly. Previously, visual cleanliness was really the only criteria people could use, but now with the advent of additional tools such as ATP and fluorescence, there are additional methods that staff can use or supervisors can use to hold staff accountable for whether or not they've cleaned. And there's a saying that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's certainly true of cleaning compliance as well. If you can't measure how well workers are cleaning equipment, then it's hard to give them feedback about where they need to improve. And in a recent study that Diversity did, we found that, that sometimes workers will tend to see all feedback as negative. But management that works at providing the feedback in a constructive way and connects it to the ultimate role for the worker, which is to help protect the patients, this can be done in ways that workers accept and in some cases uh, are actually very enthusiastic for it. People that go into this type of work want to do a good job. And so they want feedback, but the feedback has to be delivered respectfully to them, which means in a way that's valuing their performance and their role within the organization and just helps identify opportunities for improvement. These are things that can help make the, the communication of the compliance information much more acceptable to the staff. Next slide, please. So to sum up best practices, we draw a stool to, to put a leg under product and selection of the product, to put a leg under the practice, meaning the cleaning processes themselves, and to put a leg under compliance to talk about the importance of ensuring through a validation that people are following the process with the right product so that these pieces all tie together to achieve optimal disinfection. If any one of the three legs is weak, the stool will tumble over. And in the same way in practice, if any one part of this isn't solid, then you will find that you get suboptimal results. Picking products that workers don't want to use or that causes health and safety risks or that bleaches out their uniforms will make them less likely to want to use the product. Not having detailed information about who cleans what surfaces and when means that workers will have to make their own judgments about what to do and what not to do. And not auditing means that you don't know when things aren't working right. In a recent study Diversity did, one of the aha moments for us was uh, we had what was called a stat clean, where a patient was being sent up to the room. And the worker who was cleaning another room decided to finish that room before going to do the stat clean. When they went to the room, they didn't have enough time to do proper cleaning because the patient was already there. So all they did was pull the trash, change the linens, and then no other cleaning. When the room was audited, none of the surfaces had been cleaned. And if you think about what that means for a risk for the next patient coming in, the worker did nothing to mitigate the risk. But they didn't really understand the connection between the risks posed by surfaces and what can happen to a patient. And the facility modified their practice so that stat clean now means leave the room that you're cleaning and come back. Don't do any further work. You immediately start cleaning the new room. And then they inform nursing that a stat clean still takes the same amount of time. While we'll start on it right away, 
we're not going to shortcut the way we do it because it's important to protect the new patient through proper disinfection of the environment. Next slide, please. So as a summary for the discussion today, Nicole and I would agree that these seven points all represent critical areas and things that can go wrong to suboptimize cleaning and disinfection. Germs are invisible and hard to see, thus people may not want to focus on them. Not having roles and responsibilities outlined means the who, what, where, when, and how isn't being detailed. If the disinfectant requires a long contact time and the surface dries too quickly, then suboptimal disinfection is the result. If there's a compatibility issue with cleaning tools, if there's a binding issue, then the right amount of disinfectant isn't being released to the surface. If the disinfectant is harsh on surfaces and assets, then it's going to damage surfaces, making them harder to clean in the future, and potentially creating a microbial risk as well in that they can't be properly disinfected. If there are safety concerns around the proper use of the disinfectant, people won't want to use them. They'll use them minimally, and in the example Nicole gave, not only would they put on a glove, but they might use a paper towel to protect them from the, the disinfectant wipe. And envision what that means in terms of efficiency for the worker if they're taking time to do those additional steps, and if everybody in the hospital did that when they were using the wipe. And lastly, in this group, inaccessible means ineffective. If the wipes or other disinfectants aren't readily accessible for the workers to use, they're much less likely to use them. Next slide, please. We will often reference this as the seven sins of disinfection, sort of modeled on the seven deadly sins. But it's a, a model for us to use to communicate with folks like yourself about the risks inherent in disinfection and how things can go wrong. And by addressing each of these sins of disinfection, you can help optimize the performance of your disinfectant and of your hygiene program, thus helping to protect patients. Next slide, please. I really like this graphic as a way to tie together all of the elements that come together in providing a safe environment of care. Any one of these pieces, if not addressed, can contribute to the whole program sort of falling down. And when we look at uh, the performance of hospitals across the country and, and other healthcare facilities, we can generally tie failures in disinfection to a failure to address one of these areas. And for facilities that do this right, they have strong programs that address all of these areas. And for facilities that don't, they typically have problems in not just one, but more than one area. So it's easy for us to help a facility because it's not hard to find the things that they need to improve on. It's generally not one thing. It's generally several things from multiple buckets all at the same time. And having a model like this to use as a reference can make it much easier for folks like yourself on the phone to self-assess whether or not your programs are meeting the standards you have for performance. Next slide, please. So in summary, understanding, oh, I'm sorry, can you back up one slide there, please? In summary, understand the key components of a successful dis disinfection program. Hopefully we've done that for you today. We've tried to also talk about potential barriers to success and methods or techniques you can use to overcome the barriers to achieve the best results. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we'd like to thank you for participating in the webinar today. And you can see here a graphic of one of the products we offer that we think aligns well with the way that disinfection needs to be performed in healthcare. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Heather to start the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you so much to Nicole and Peter for that informative and enjoyable presentation. We'll now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder to the audience, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have for the Q&A and can follow up on questions they don't have the opportunity to address. So to start, I have a question here that says, in the slide where you mentioned that drying time should be greater or equal to the kill time, um, how do you measure this? Maybe Peter can address this first. Yeah, that's a good question. It's difficult to do in practice if you don't have some sort of standardized technique. What we do internally is we take a one foot square vinyl composition tile, floor tile, and coat it with floor finish. And then we apply disinfectant to it, and we weigh the tile. And as the disinfectant evaporates off, the weight drops down to what the towel was beforehand. 
if you were trying to, so it's for us in the lab, it's very easy to, to get a very uh, clear analytical sense of when the surface is dried. In practice, if you wipe the surface, and I'll just take a, like a, a glucometer that you're wiping with the disinfectant wipe. If you sit there with the stopwatch and simply estimate to yourself when is the surface is starting to appear to be dry, and when is the surface is more than 50% dry. By the time you get to 50% dry, you're likely in a range where you're stopped disinfection on more than half of the object, and that's a point at which I would have more concern about whether or not you're getting additional kill. And in most cases, we're not talking about there being a difference between one minute and 50 seconds and two minutes being all that critical. We're talking about products that maybe have very high alcohol contents that have label contact times of two, three, and four minutes. But when you use it, the disinfectant on the surface, no matter how hard you work to apply it, dries within 20 to 30 seconds. So it's a, a multiple or a factor difference between contact time and dry time, not something that's really all that subtle. So it, it's not particularly hard to see in my experience. Great. Thank you, Peter. Nicole, do you have anything to add there? No, I think Peter covered that perfectly. Perfect. Then we'll move on to the next question here. Um, what products or technologies will be safer for facility assets for compatibility? Peter, would you like to start again? Sure. I think if you look at products that um, are based on actives like hydrogen peroxide, uh, they have excellent safety profiles. There are products that are quaternary-based also that can be reasonable, but sometimes quaternary-based products have a lot of alcohol in with them. That can create more risk. I don't think I can give you a blanket statement that there's only one way to assess this because of the complexity in the construction of the equipment. But if you look at the user's guides for a lot of this equipment and you look at the types of products that are recommended, you get a sense of what types of chemistries they think are and are not safe. And I'll add also that even in situations where the disinfectants aren't particularly safe for the surface, often that risk can be mitigated through protocol or process change by making sure that you don't leave excess disinfectant on the surface, or by drying the surface after the contact time, or by rinsing the surface with water and a damp cloth, you can help protect the asset. So sometimes there's a desire to use the same disinfectant, and then you're going to have a few pieces of equipment that are more sensitive. By having a protocol variation for those pieces, you can help make sure that you can keep the convenience of using one product, but not unduly damage the asset. Nicole, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, no, Peter, I completely agree with you. I think, um, you know, I understand the, the concept within healthcare. We want to, you know, keep everything as simple as possible, try to have one product um, for everything. But I think, you know, to try to simplify it even further, is think about what we do in our houses. We have multiple products. We have glass cleaners. We have products that we're using for, you know, if we have leather couches or, or uh, for granite or what have you. It, there are different products for different surfaces because of um, compatibility um, issues. And so even within the healthcare area, we need to need to remember it's either we instill a different protocol so that we're applying whether it's a rinse or, or a wiping dry so that we're trying to minimize residue or potential concern, or we just understand that there are going to be some um, pieces of equipment that require a different chemical, a different disinfectant to be used. And we just make certain that we have the processes in place, that our staff are properly trained, and things like that will generally go smoothly then. Okay, thank you both for addressing that one. We have another question here. Um, could you expand on why ATP monitors should not be used to compare disinfectants? I believe you mentioned that the residuals from the chemicals will react with ATP monitor differently. And Nicole, mm -hmm. could you address that one? Sure. Um, so what happens when we deal with, uh, with ATP um, monitor? The chemical reaction and how a disinfectant will react with, with that can either quench or enhance the result, meaning that what we're seeing is um, the results are either artificially lower than they should or they've been increased. And so examples of that will be chlorine, as an example, will always provide a lower result than products that have uh, surfactants in them. So a lot of the clot-based products or products, from, uh, the hydrogen peroxide-based products that, that do contain surfactants or detergents in them, those detergents will sometimes enhance or increase 
um, the RLU reading. So when you're comparing product to product um, amongst two different chemistries, that's really is, is where the concern is, is there because of how the, uh, the, the difference in how the chemical will interfere with the ATP reading. Um, and so that's really, really with bleach, and particularly with anything that has a, a surfactant, that's where we need to, to understand that you can't compare one to the other. Okay, Peter, anything to add there? Yeah, I'd add that I think if you ask the manufacturers of ATP meters, most of them will tell you that to make the data usable, you should really consider one disinfectant and then compare surfaces using the same disinfectant. I think what Nicole said is spot on, and that you introduce this additional variability by changing which disinfectant and thus potentially which level of surfactant is, is going to be left on surfaces. Okay. And we have time for one more question, I believe. Um, this one says, many disinfectants are labeled for hard surfaces. Are these still appropriate for soft surfaces like mattresses and stretchers? If no, what cleaner do you recommend for these surfaces? Peter, could you address that? Sure. I think we want to start by making a distinction between a surface that's flexible and one that's truly soft. Soft to me means a surface that's absorbent. So if you think of cloth cushions or something like that, carpeting, this is an absorbent material. But you can have vinyl and other types of plastics, which are hard surfaces because they don't absorb liquid, but that they are still flexible. Mattress covers is a good example of one of these types of things. A mattress cover is used to protect the mattress. And while the surface of the mattress cover itself is very flexible, if it's a commercial grade mattress cover, it won't absorb liquid and can be disinfected with uh, the traditional commercial disinfectants. The watch out is that in many cases, the compromise to make the plastic flexible makes it more prone to damage by disinfectants, and often you'll have to use protocol variations to ensure that you don't damage these flexible plastics. Now, if you're talking about true soft surfaces, like a lot of the privacy curtains, some of the ones on the market now carry additional claims where they've been specifically tested against fabric for use. I would be cautious about using products that haven't been tested until you know what the impact is on the curtain. In some cases, some disinfectants can damage curtains. And by going through the EPA process of getting the soft surface claim, you know that the manufacturer is making an effort to demonstrate safety on softer fabrics. Nicole, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think um, I've never used the flexible thing. I think that was a really good example to kind of illustrate that. Um, the other thing, too, is with the soft surface claims, it, it's important for everybody to understand that these aren't disinfection claims. These are just sanitizing claims. So in essence, we're rendering the surface um, safe. The efficacy will be against vegetative um, bacteria. Um, but do not have uh, virus claims. And so I think, you know, it's important for people to understand that when we're dealing with soft surface claims that it is not truly disinfection. It's simply just a, it's a sanitizing that helps us to um, provide a safer environment for our patients. All right. Thank you to both Nicole and Peter. We have run out of time for today's presentation. Um, I want to thank both of you for your excellent presentation and for everyone in the audience for participating today. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. This concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon.